Hey everyone, uh, my name is Andrew Gall. Today I'll be talking about maintaining an open source project while sustaining your sanity. Uh, if you'd like to follow along with the slides, uh, you can see them at gall.org slash talks. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a maintainer of several uh, small and medium-sized projects. Um, uh, what these projects do in particular is not, not important. Uh, they're cloud-related. Um, but I've been working on them for five and 10 years now. Um, and uh, have some thoughts on, on how to on a, how do we sustain those over a long period of time. Um, these, these projects have uh, only a few maintainers, uh, a larger number of contributors, and a much larger number of users, uh, more, more than the maintainers can, um, can really um, um, satisfy all the, the issues. Uh, the virtual format makes this difficult, but I do live in Tokyo. Um, OK, let's define what project maintainership means. Uh, so there's a lot of different tasks in here, uh, more than just um, uh, programming or, or generally software engineering. Uh, so that includes working with users, uh, triaging issues, cu cutting releases, uh, scoping the project, coordinating contributors, uh, working with external projects, reviewing code, improving quality, uh, and writing new code sometimes. Um, and as the commit strip comment uh, suggests uh, users believe that there's a lot of different individuals uh, doing all this, but there's usually uh, just one or two people that are actually working on these projects. Um, and so it's, it's pretty difficult to do everything. Okay, uh, so you will burn yourself out if you try to do everything. I try to do all of these maintainer tasks and all the programming and all these user uh, interaction. Um, and so to sustain your sanity, um, I'm going to recommend that you Consider your project from different vantage points. Uh, I'm going to map these onto functional roles at, um, at companies, uh, but it's it's kind of a series of values about different, thinking about different people in the process. And to do this, you have to try to do um, less work, um, but different work over longer periods of time uh, to sustain the project. And this this may allow you to keep the project going for years. Um, but you'll have to make a deal with the devil. Uh, you'll have to get into management, uh, which um, is, is uh, challenging for, for ICs uh, like me. So project maintainers wear many hats. Uh, the first of which is the product manager hat, where you advocate for the user. Uh, the second is engineering manager, where you advocate for the team. Uh, third is technical lead, where you advocate for the code. And so this talk explores these three roles and what you can do with few resources and lack of uh, corporate sponsorship. Okay, uh, the first role is thinking like a product manager. And this, this role is really advocating for the user. And so the first thing you wanna do is evaluate the project against the ecosystem. And there's a lot of different sources of information from Hacker News to Stack Overflow, uh, Twitter, um, but you're trying to see what people are saying about the project uh, that may not be reflected in your issues. And so uh, this, these could be uh, compatibility with other software. Um, maybe it's, it's the incompatibility is in another piece of software that um, the bugs filed there, um, but uh, it's, it's actually related to your project that maybe you, you can do something to help them. Or maybe people are complaining about performance or, or some other use case they don't think scopes in, and there's just not an issue for it. Uh, the second important thing uh, uh, PMs do is they think about uh, how users interact with the project. And this could be um, uh, configuration, right? Like how do you actually set this up? Are there are sane ways to do this or does it require a bunch of uh, fiddling with different bits? Does it work out of box? Uh, are there releases, regular releases uh, that users are consuming or they have to compile it themselves? Uh, packaging, are, are, you in the, um, are you in Linux distributions? Are you in, uh, on Docker Hub? Like, is it easy to start using your project? Uh, documentation is important. Uh, in, in one sense, just to tell people what's going on, but also to protect your time so they're not constantly asking you, how, how do you use the software? Uh, kind of a scaling trick. Um, and backwards compatibility is an important thing as well. Uh, in the real world, people mix and match software versions and data formats. Uh, do you, you fail cleanly when you try to uh, use an unsupported configuration? Do you corrupt your data? What, 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 how, how does it actually work in these mixed environments? And the third thing that PMs do that you're probably more familiar with is prioritizing new features and critical fixes. And so if you, um, after you've evaluated the project, uh, you can you can kind of determine what's most important and say like, hey, this, this is something we want to address sooner rather than later. 
Um, and there's, there's some other uh, tricks here where not everything requires like a code solution or even a clean code solution. Uh, if there's an e easy immediate workaround for a user, either you know, avoiding a certain configuration or uh, turning off a feature or something that, that works around things in the short term, that, that's oftentimes more um, impactful uh, immediately than saying, hey, can you wait six months or maybe never to, to get a proper fix? Uh, last thing I'd say is that uh, PMs look at competing projects. Uh, competing is kind of a nebulous term in the open source uh, world, but there's uh, essentially things that we can coordinate on so that it uh, doesn't stress out users as much, whether it's um, similar terminology or sharing um, uh, some kinds of configuration can be shared between different projects. Uh, maybe if you think about the, the SQL ecosystem from MySQL to Postgres to SQLite, uh, trying to have code run on all three is, is pretty difficult. And if they had used similar, similar words and nouns, sometimes that would have been uh, better. Okay, issues, issues everywhere. Um, so most projects are drowning in issues, things that are um, uh, not able to be immediately addressed. Uh, but these can be the highest quality feedback from your users. Uh, some people really go out of their way to minimize a test case or tell you exactly what's going on or, or test the latest version and the development branch. Um, and so issues can be super, super valuable. Um, or <laughs> they can be a junkyard of uh, vague, unresolved symptoms and a piece. Um, usually a little bit of both in my, in my experience. Um, and so the way that you can improve your issues is that you want to groom them. And so this is to help you understand the state of the project. You know, what are the most critical issues? Um, you know, what's, what's still pending? Um, but also to help your users understand the project. If, if you attach the right kind of metadata, you can tell them, you know, nobody's working on this or I want, I want help or something like that. Uh, you, can, you can say like, hey, this is really your responsibility to, to move forward on this. And so the, the three things that will improve the average quality of your issues are clarifying the issue. You know, like, how does this happen? Um, you know, what configuration are you using? Which version? Um, Deduplicating issues. Um, oftentimes a popular issue will be open several times because people don't understand the, um, the, the, the commonality between that and the previous issue. Uh, and finally, closing stale issues. Uh, if somebody's not working on, uh, if, there, if it's not actionable, uh, if there's not enough information, it's been stale, just, just close it, it it's okay. Um, somebody will open another issue again someday, maybe, maybe a higher quality one. And the two bits I, I really want to emphasize here is I like to mark issues with the help wanted label and the need info label. So help wanted means that user, that no one's going to work on this and it's requiring a user to step up as a contributor and to fix it for the project. Um, and, and this kind of uh, avoids some silly comments like when is this going to be fixed? Uh, if they see the help wanted label, hopefully they understand. Um, need info is a, a good one as well. If you can't act on an issue because you're waiting for something, just slap a need info label on it. And um, this, this avoids ambiguity and misunderstandings. Uh, sometimes the bug reporter is waiting on the uh, maintainer and maintainer is waiting on the bug reporter and things just um, stalemate uh, accidentally, actually. Uh, so try to avoid that. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of case studies as we go through here. I'll talk about some of the projects and the problems and the successes we've had. Um, the first is S3FS, uh, this mounts the S3 bucket as a file system. Uh, it's a very old project. I, I came into it um, um, about seven or eight years ago. It's hard to remember when. Um, and uh, there, there were tons of issues and I, I was just trying to understand what's, what's going on in this project. And the grooming process revealed that there were two major themes that I, I thought were actionable. And the first was a small issue where um, POSIX or Linux permissions, those kind of 644 and 755 bits, uh, they mapped poorly onto S3 objects and it created an interoperability problem um, with using other S3 apps. And there was a workaround for this that someone had contributed that you just needed a, a flag with uh, the uh, complement of the bits or something like that. And it was, was super unintuitive uh, to do this workaround. And there was, it was actually a really satisfying and 20 line pull request that fixed multiple issues uh, both in GitHub and on Stack Overflow simultaneously. And it was with so little effort that I felt bad that we hadn't identified this earlier in the project. Uh, the second major theme that grooming revealed was that there were multiple symptoms of data corruption. And this is kind of a, uh, the most important thing for a file system, like do not lose data, you must return the data that user wrote into it. And uh, this, this was not simple. Uh, we, we iterated for years with users trying to understand the symptoms, things that couldn't be reproduced. 
um, we had to improve testing and kind of um, evaluate new tooling to find some kinds of race conditions. And there were, were several bug fixes, more than several actually. It, 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 was, it was a long campaign, but um, over, over the years we were able to uh, improve the reliability and there's, I don't believe there's any open issues uh, today. Uh, the downside of the grooming was uh, that there were hundreds of other issues. Uh, we, uh, there, there were good, there was good information in there, um, but we couldn't act on it. There wasn't enough um, contributor or maintainer um, uh, engineer hours in the day to work on this stuff. So I dutifully categorized these and tried to get see what the um, see what see what they were, and then it promptly ignored them um, in, in the short term. Um, but then we we've been making slow progress on these, and so the issue count. Um, uh, kind of it trickles up, uh, it kind of slowly increases over time. And then as, as we groom things every three months, it'll, it'll dark down. Um, and uh, let's, it's generally speaking, the, the severity of issues is going down over time, even with a, a larger user base. Okay, working with users. Uh, I love users, I, I hate users. Um, they are, are some of the most helpful people um, you'll meet that are, are logically part of your team, even though they don't um, write code. Um, or, or neutral, many users are just neutral. They're reporting bugs and they're kind of doing an okay job. And thank you for your, your effort. Um, there's, there's a third class of people that are, are less pleasant, uh, break the center into two categories. Uh, there's just there's angry people in the world and they, they find their place on the internet and they, they make some noise and uh, just recommend uh, ignoring them and not, not getting bummed out about it. Uh, there, there are abusive situations and, and please do report those uh, if needed. Uh, but a second class of kind of um, uh, annoying users are entitled people. And these people keep asking, you know, when's the fix or, you know, you, where's, where's the progress in this? And you, you can usually see this more in client, um, uh, client uh, use, end user software than um, uh, backend infrastructure stuff. But uh, these, these people, uh, they're not bad people, I, I don't think. <laughs> I think they just, uh, they misunderstand their relationship to the project. Um, they, you can educate these people. Uh, the, the phrase I like to use is, this is a volunteer project, um, pull requests are welcome. Uh, just making it clear that your time is not uh, their time, right? They, they don't have any control of you. Uh, and in fact, I would flip the script when you think about your users. Uh, users should work for the maintainers. Uh, the maintainers are fewer than the users. Users uh, have, there's more of them and they have more time. Uh, they should be working to clarify users, uh, clarify issues and to um, test proposed PRs, uh, investigate workarounds, improve documentation and wikis. Uh, and sometimes you just have to ask them, you know, hey, can you look into this? And it's, it's just kind of increasing your, your team, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Okay, um, putting your PM hat on, I would say that releases are important. Uh, there's a lot of projects, especially older projects that don't run releases very often, you know, maybe every couple of years, even when they're merging um, commits and at least to kind of forks and, and kind of uh, duplication and confusion. And so I, I just emphasize that most users consume release versions, not development branch. Um, and so you really want to have regular kind of time-based releases. Uh, this was pioneered by uh, Chrome, but I, I think that you, you don't need such an aggressive four-week schedule. That that's, can be exhausting for users. But I, I think even every six months uh, is, is valuable. And so I, I plan to run a, a release of most of my software every six months, even if there's not uh, a huge number of changes. Uh, still, people are waiting for some of those, those fixes. And of course, if there's an immediate um, critical bug fix, I uh, try to run a, um, a release sooner. Uh, in, in terms of sustaining your sanity, uh, you want to avoid buggy releases. And so this is uh, twofold. Um, one is which is it's bad for your users if they're having buggy code and it creates work for them. Uh, the second thing is it actually creates work for you uh, when they file an issue saying, hey, this, this release doesn't work. And there's kind of a long tail of people using old versions we'll talk about in a moment that you will um, uh, essentially be re-diagnosing the same bugs for um, until those uh, older code filter out of the ecosystem. So to, to avoid bug, bug releases, I open a tracking issue. Um, I ask some of the users to test it. Like People are waiting for these releases. They're, they're usually happy to test it in their environment. Um, and you have to, you have to slow down changes, uh, during this time. Uh, I've, I've had some situations where I had an open PR and I said, you know what, this is too risky for the next release. We'll just get it next time in, in six months. Um, and that, that's okay. Um, 
So you want to be aware of users reporting new bugs against old versions. Um, so uh, this, a lot of people, a lot of people run older versions of, of software, and it's worth understanding why. Um, there's oftentimes stale Linux distribution packages or uh, API breakage that prevent upgrading uh, important regressions. Um, but these these new bugs against old versions, you're, you're basically making more work for yourself uh, if, if people are using the old code. Um, and so if you can nudge them onto the new code, especially mentioned in your issue template, you know, please report against the latest version, uh, you'll tend to um, uh, free up some time for yourself. Okay, part two, thinking like an engineering manager. So again, this is advocating for the team. Um, and maybe the, the most important thing you can do to advocate for the team is to manage the project scope against the goals of the project and the um, uh, volunteer effort you have available. Uh, the second thing that um, a manager can do is they can bring more people and resources onto the project. There's kind of a couple of hacks for that we'll talk about. Um, third is uh, coordination with external projects, um, both your, your upstream and downstream uh, dependencies and dependents. And finally, dealing with forks, uh, kind of a quirk of open source. We have uh, a lot of different limitations of the same thing. Okay, managing the team. Uh, so this, this differs from your normal um, manager kind of mindset, uh, because usually you can't tell people what to do. Um, instead, you can ask them for help. Um, and you, you shouldn't feel shy about doing this. Uh, just at mention people on, on GitHub. Like, Hey, could you could you look at this PR? You worked on on a similar feature before, um, and this this is important because people um, people don't uh, watch the repository sometimes, or there's a flood of email, or they're kind of batch processing, whatever it is. And I think that the um, manager should try to identify: Are there any blockers to new contributors to bringing these new people onto the team? And so the, the most important one is: Do you have a bad environment? <laughs> you know, are, are there people or users uh, that are in your, your um, uh, GitHub repository, they're, you know, mean, right? Or, or short with people or, um, you know, is it, is it just a bad project to work with? Uh, there's, there's projects I choose not to contribute with because of, there's one or more people that are um, just not a lot of fun and I like, like this too short. Uh, so build issues is maybe the, the second and more easily addressable uh, thing. Uh, can, can users build your software out of uh, out of a clean environment. Uh, so there's been a lot of progress with um, containers and other kind of uh, mechanisms to deal with this. But uh, generally, is, is this project easy to, to run the unit tests on is, is kind of a metric that you should um, uh, strive for. And to some extent, uh, you know, the, there's the continuous integration you set up will have a configuration and can figure this out, but you, you might need some documentation as well. Um, third, just technical debt. Um, if a project's too, um, if, there's, if it's too rotten, it, people don't want to contribute. Uh, it's, it's just, it's difficult and it's not fun. Um, you know, if you're using older dependencies or older versions of software, uh, it's, uh, it's just it's, it, exhausting to kind of go back in time and, and use things that are um, kind of semi-broken. Um, important one to me is missing license. Uh, I, my employer doesn't allow me to contribute to projects that don't have an open source license. So please add one. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, unclear code formatting can block people contributing, um, especially in the review process. If, if you're having to, to comment on a lot of things and the, the uh, user has to um, iterate with you on, on PRs to have your perfect code formatting, that's it's usually a bad time and, and annoying to both the reviewer and the contributor. So if you use anything that's automated, like Go format or the equivalents in C++ or Java, uh, that tends to be a better experience for users instead of trying to guess what, what you're thinking. Okay, managing the team, you can, you can actually uh, nudge issue reporters into becoming contributors. Um, a lot of people are reluctant to, um, to, to try to contribute because they don't know where to start. Uh, code uh, is, is big, right? <laughs> As uh, most projects, um, have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of lines of, of code and um, we're, we're potentially much larger for big projects, but uh, people don't know where to start. So if you just tell them, hey, can you go look at this, this file, right? And you probably want to write a test in this other file. Um, that, that can kind of overcome some friction and get you uh, a free fix sometimes. Uh, similarly, you can outsource testing of PRs to issue reporters. 
uh, they tend to be pretty motivated uh, to test these things if it, um, if it resolves their symptom. So um, you know, don't test it yourself, uh, outsource it to them. And lastly, uh, dependencies are logically part of your code. You, you ship your dependencies. Um, so do you have a good relationship with your upstream projects? Like, do you report issues? You know, do you tell them like how the software is working or not working for you? Uh, it's just important to communicate. Okay, um, managers uh, should aggressively manage the project scope. Um, and so there's a common anti-pattern in open source software. We try to be everything to everyone. Um, it's just really um, uh, compelling that somebody comes by with a, a pull request and it passes the unit test, you know, why not add this feature? And I, I, there's a lot of good reasons not to, um, that your, your maintenance uh, burden will increase. Uh, so not all post changes need to be merged upstream, uh, even well-written ones. And so look at, look at the, the contribution and say, you know, does this make my burden uh, heavier or lighter? And if it's heavier, uh, can I ask the contributor to maintain that code? It's like, hey, I'm willing to merge this, but you need to deal with all these issues. That's my expectation. And it's, um, it's very easy to, uh, to widen the project scope and take on new tasks, but it's very hard to shed them. Um, this is because there becomes a constituency within your, your project and when one noisy contributor will say like, hey, I, I contributed that and I'll fix it, uh, fix any bugs, even when they, maybe they don't. <laughs> so uh, keep in practice of saying no or not yet, uh, early and often. Um, it's, it's actually fine. You won't hurt people's feelings. Just be clear with them about uh, what, what you're doing. Uh, I have a kind of a negative case study uh, for this. Um, so uh, JClouds is a Java uh, cross-cloud abstraction. Um, this, this project was very popular uh, 10 years ago. I had a lot of activity, uh, both from contributors and users. Uh, the uh, maintainers uh, have shrunk over time. Uh, and this is despite there, there being a kind of stable user base and downloads uh, that we, we can observe. And what's happened is, is a bad situation where there's more work being done by the fewer remaining maintainers. And so uh, we take on a bunch of scope that we couldn't manage. Um, people that advocate for their feature that disappeared, or people that wanted um, kind of infinite backwards compatibility. And so we had to shrink the scope of the project, um, kind of right size it. And there were a couple things we did. We, we tossed out a bunch of code that was, was unmaintained, that there was no, no one that would maintain it. And you, know, get, you can always bring things back in later, uh, just uh, revert to commit, it's fine. So we, we removed that stuff that was, had flaky tests and that kind of thing. Uh, we outsourced some difficult features uh, to separate projects, uh, things that we didn't have the expertise for um, that we couldn't maintain. So we just jettisoned them. Uh, we did find other maintainers for them in this, this case, uh, but that's not always possible. Uh, we dropped a lot of backwards compatibility. Uh, this, this was really painful because they're, they're became increasingly hard to uh, run both the newer and older versions of, of Java. And so we, we had preferred the old versions for reasons that are kind of related to the Java ecosystem, but uh, that was the wrong choice for us. Uh, we had to upgrade some of our dependencies. Uh, this, this sounds benign, but it really wasn't. Uh, some of these dependencies are really tough uh, where they um, uh, have incompatibilities between versions and it breaks other people's downstream software. And so we had to make tough choices there to, to go forward. And finally, we kind of, we're optimizing the um, release process. Uh, we had many repositories to begin with and now we're down to four and that really should be one um, just to make things um, as, push -button, as push button as possible for making a release. Uh, it's currently like a uh, hundred different steps to <laughs> run a release. And so the, you end up running releases less often, which is bad for users. And so maybe the sad thing here was a lot of these changes should have been made years ago. Um, we, we just made their own choices and not that we were bad people, uh, I don't think, but um, we, we just didn't uh, think about our maintenance burden in a very rigorous way. We just kept saying yes. Okay, dealing with forks. Um, forks and kind of re-implementations have uh, several causes. Um, the most benign of which is um, users just, they need the fix now, they cherry pick a fix into, a, um, into their repo and they will rejoin you in the next release. So don't worry about those people unless there's a lot of them for some reason, they go in a release then. Um, some forks are just local functionality that's inappropriate or not ready for mainline. Maybe it hasn't been made high quality enough or doesn't address all the use cases that you uh, wanna see done. Uh, but the last kind of fork is a, a kind of harder fork 
And that's when there's um, a difference of opinion, uh, either uh, in what the project scope is, you, you really want to expand it and do some different things, or licensing, sometimes that, that can um, uh, separate people. Uh, interpersonal disagreement, people that, that just can't get along and shouldn't be working together because they're hurting each other. And it's, it's actually, you know, some of these are, are good reasons to fork. And don't, um, don't, don't worry too much about uh, the presence of forks. Uh, I will say that reintegrating forks can unify the users and the development effort. Um, I, uh, S3FS has integrated uh, two of its forks over time, um, and there's some re-implementations that we do collaborate with uh, to kind of share tests and kind of talk about um, software in, in, in similar ways. Uh, and this, this is to reduce user pain. Users can switch between uh, different implementations sometimes, and, and that's fine too. Um, we'll say that most forks will just die of neglect, um, but it's worth understanding their motivations. Uh, you know, they're, they're, these really do address uh, pain points for, for users, uh, but in the long run, which, whichever, whichever of the forks has more uh, developers and maintainers will essentially live longer. Um, it, there's just, it's just too hard, it's too much work to sustain things yourself. All right, part three, thinking like a technical lead. Uh, this is probably the most familiar role to, to many of you. Uh, this is advocating for the technology. Um, and so the first thing you're doing when you're advocating for technology is trying to protect the existing code. Uh, this tends to be more important than new code, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, second, think about the project evolution over the long term. And long term uh, could be one year, maybe, maybe even 10 years that we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, and technically, um, can make proactive technical investments uh, in the project. And these are bigger than a single issue. Uh, and these might be using new tooling or, or other things that increase the quality or make the project um, easier to maintain. Uh, and, and lastly, as a, as a lead, uh, you need to lead people. Um, you need to communicate with your contributors and tell them what you're thinking. And, and maybe ask them what they're thinking, try to understand uh, what's going on with them. Okay, uh, again, existing code is more important than new code. Uh, the cost of regressions is actually much higher than, than you think. Um, things, it's, it's not just the, fixing the, the initial problem, but this kind of echoes through time with, with uh, duplicate issues of people using old code or um, um, other, other kinds of um, uh, interactions in the ecosystem where, where people start uh, depending on broken behavior or, or something like that. And so the most important way, uh, more impactful way to, um, to prevent this is to write, write some tests and use continuous integration. Uh, pe people always tell you that, and it's always true. Uh, there's just kind of a limit to what you can do in a volunteer project. Uh, but if, if I had to pick uh, between unit tests or integration tests, I, I would probably pick integration tests. Uh, while a unit test has a, a high accuracy of, of telling you, um, you know, exactly where a problem is, uh, it's low, low coverage, right? R versus an integration test, Maybe uh, it, it you know it does a hundred different things and one of them fails and you don't know which one. But you can you can still gate a, a PR on um, that one failure and say hey you figure it out and by the way can you write me a unit test uh, that uh, prevents this in the future. Um, so code review uh, is a great process. It it really does increase um, the quality of. Uh, of a project. Uh, it's also important uh, to share kind of tribal knowledge about how, how to work with the project. Uh, but this is really labor intensive in open source projects where you have a lot of um, new contributors or drive by contributors. And so uh, you want to be, you want to kind of give the right amount of uh, feedback there and don't, don't overdo it. Uh, if you can automate things with, um, with either linting or other kind of um, static analysis tools, uh, that, that can be good. Uh, it tends to be a false positive rate on some of those. You know, be careful about your time there as well. Uh, so one kind of trick for protect, protecting code is that you want to take these giant 2,000 line PRs that uh, users contribute and try to um, try to break those up. Um, once a once a big change goes in, it's usually pretty hard to figure out uh, where exactly the problem was if if indeed something is is uh, regressing. So uh, try, to, try to encourage people to write smaller PRs um, maybe and spread them over a longer period of time where you might be able to um, either do a git rebase uh, to, oh, sorry, git um, uh, bisect to, to figure out where, where a regression snuck in or, um, 
uh, it, it, when releases go out, you know, it's, it's gradually making these changes and you're gradually getting uh, new test coverage. And to track the ex this existing code, you, um, you want to evaluate the proposed change and say, how does this interact with cur the current feature set and maybe the future um, uh, feature set that we envision for the project? And maybe a, a simple example there would be, um, it, there's always PRs for, for adding more knobs. Um, and maybe you have like some cache size or something like that. And there's a knob for that. And the users will work around their, um, uh, their whatever local issue they're having with a, another flag. And the, the cognitive load of having a hundred flags is, is pretty high. Uh, how do they interact with each other? Um, do they interact with each other well? And, and so if, uh, if you think like, hey, we're going to change how this works in the future, you know, we're going to have a sm smarter cache policy or something, and this, this flag's not necessary, you know, maybe you say no to that feature, and that, that user carries that flag in their um, local, re um, local repository until um, you can have a proper fix in mainline. OK, um, evaluating technical risk. Uh, you really want to critically evaluate proposed changes. Uh, like, does it actually improve the user experience or is it just something fun? Uh, you know, th there's um, uh, taking on maybe MongoDB or, or something like that. It seemed really cool 10 years ago. Um, and maybe you say we'll have infinite scale or something like that. But it, it's maybe it was true, maybe it wasn't. Um, you know, th there's different kinds of um, uh, databases maybe you would use, and some of them are actually easier for, for users. They don't need that kind of scale. And maybe, maybe nobody needed that scale uh, to begin with. Um, so uh, does a proposed change limit your contributors? Uh, let's say uh, um, you're a Java-based project and someone wants to, to write some closure, uh, which is a uh, Java-based uh, common list. Um, and it, the, um, this was well received at the time and then that user disappeared and no one on the team knew closure. And so it kind of limited uh, our ability to modify that piece of the software. And so, uh, you know, be careful with the, the things you're taking on. Uh, they, they can really uh, limit your, your contributors who, who don't know all these tools. Uh, and then look at whether it increases or decreases the maintenance burden. Uh, if it, it decreases it, um, it that, that's a good sign, right? If it adds a test, that, that you know, it's more code, but it, it kind of increases your confidence in the software and reduces the regressions. Um, if it, it kind of removes functionality that's not really being used, that, that's good for you as well. Uh, if people are adding new things that have kind of uh, expensive uh, cost to you, you, you can say no, um, or maybe the, you need to change that to, to be something that's more compatible with, with how you're looking at the software. And there was a great talk a couple years ago called Choosing Boring Technology and um, thinking about the innovation tokens. And the, these are finite in number, maybe you have three um, Musk coins, Elon Musk coins. And you want to spend them wisely and maybe not spend them at all uh, or spend one or one or two of them. Like if you're starting a new project or, or taking on some, something new, like you're, you're, if you're spending one of these tokens, uh, will, will that uh, dependency or, or, or feature you're taking on, will that, um, essentially will that uh, uh, work out over the long term or will it create more problems for you over time? And so the thesis of the talk was choose boring things uh, if, if you don't have, um, unless the situation warrants it. And, and so that's, it's kind of just being safe. Uh, and the reason for this is if you take all the risks, um, one of them will, will, get, will burn you. Um, if you take all the shiny objects, um, and some projects start with it that way, uh, you'll, you'll just get weighed down by, by one, of, one of those unlucky choices. Uh, and think about the project evolution. Um, if you're taking on a new library, will that new library have maintainers next year? Or will you have to start maintaining that library yourself as well? Um, you know, it tends to be like older projects tend to have a bigger community and live longer. And, and so they have a, a advantage that you, you maybe trust them to be around uh, in the future as well. Okay, technical debt. Uh, this has a lot of meetings to a lot of people, but I would say that any issue that increases your development friction uh, is technical debt. And that could be missing tests, uh, flaky tests, uh, or slow tests. Um, uh, the number of uh, uh, hours or potentially a day or <laughs> that I've wasted on uh, tests that had unnecessary sleeps in them, you know, or the test took uh, two minutes instead of one minute. Uh, some of this stuff is just worth fixing. And of course, flaky tests, if things are um, randomly failing, uh, it's, it's not good because you spend time diagnosing that flaky uh, failure. 
And I would even say just, just disable that test. It's, it's not complete. Um, remove it or disable it until um, someone can fix it. Uh, missing tests are tough. Um, you know, if you don't have test coverage, you essentially are in the dark for regressions. Uh, those, those are usually harder to backfill. A uh, lot, lot of work to backfill. Um, other kinds of technical debt include uh, outdated uh, dependencies. Um, this this can be um, this can be buggy, uh, maybe security holes or, or things like that. And upgrading um, tends to uh, at least give the users confidence, uh, your end user confidence that this project it takes these issues seriously. Um, obviously, unnecessary dependencies are possible too, where maybe the standard library of your language takes on. Um, certain feature that uh, previously was you required a library for, and it's, it's good to uh, kind of re-up those. Th those can even be good first bugs for potential contributors. Uh, hey, can you help me with this kind of thing? And generally, you, um, if you can, you want to move from entry uh, custom implementations to shared <clears throat> third-party libraries. Uh, this this is to decrease your your burden. Um, it, you want to kind of push those things out or use common code. Uh, this is easier to reason about for new contributors, uh, less work for you. Um, and, and similarly, I look at, can you push features out of your project into other projects? This could be, uh, the, you know, custom implementations, or it could be um, even little libraries. Uh, so I, I, long story, but I had written an HTTP clone, an HTTP bin clone in Java, and that was one of the testing things I had written. And it was just better to push that out into its own project that has a, a couple of contributor, contributors now. And it's more useful to more people. Um, and I would recommend that you try to pay down some of your existing debt before you take on new debts. Um, think of the technical debt you have with a credit card. And if you hit the limit, you're usually in a bad situation because you can't keep borrowing against the, the credit card. Um, so try to pay down some of that debt before you take on new ones. Uh, Here's kind of a negative case study again from S3FS. Uh, this, this implements a S3 client via libcurl. Uh, this, is, this was for a good reason. This was done back in 2007 before um, C++ uh, third-party uh, libraries existed. And historically, this has been a source of bugs, uh, you know, all sorts of things with URL encoding and all the fiddly things. And we've, we fixed this gradually over time. Um, but there's other features that are more difficult. Um, mostly advanced authentication me mechanisms. And these are missing in SRFS that are present in most other um, uh, S3 uh, applications. And it's, it's frustrating users. They, they don't understand why we wrote it this way. Um, you know, they don't know the full history. They, they just want their feature. And so we can actually fix this. Um, if we transitioned uh, to the AWS SDK, it would address uh, this debt. Um, it comes with some trade-offs. Or as a new, newer C++ compiler and uh, we could probably do that pretty easily. Uh, that would hurt some of our legacy users, but uh, of course, some refactoring that is not a lot of fun. And I've looked at this a couple of times, but always, always defer it. Uh, it's always something more important to do. Um, and unfortunately, the maintainers, uh, me and the, the other maintainer, we keep paying these short-term costs fixing these little bugs instead of addressing the long-term issue. Uh, it's always, I'll do it tomorrow, <laughs> and we said yesterday. Um, so technical leaders uh, need to get in the, um, in the habit of thinking out loud and maybe over-communicating. Uh, and this is because the internet makes uh, some kinds of collaboration more difficult. Uh, you know, you can't just have a coffee with someone and, and hash out, you know, your technical issue or maybe even interpersonal issue. And so you want to um, uh, foster a sense of community with your contributors and users. And this is more than just sharing your code. You want to share your ideas. And so you you can do this in, in GitHub issues. Um, some older projects have mailing lists. Uh, those, those are good too, especially threaded discussions. Uh, Twitter, Twitter's okay, uh, but you essentially want to say like, hey, you know, this this is what I'm thinking about this feature. What do you think, right? And maybe you can um, improve your design that way, or maybe it's just a heads up to people like, uh, this is this is coming. You know, do you have any any objections to this? And maybe you can front load um, some of those before. Um, uh, before writing too much code. And I would bias towards over-communicating. Uh, just, just tell people what you think, you know? I, I just like to be loud. Being loud is my favorite. Um, you, you can share work in progress commits. Uh, there's some people that are um, shy about contributing, but uh, if you show them like, hey, this is my process, uh, you know, and here's, here's something incomplete, what I'm iterate, iterating on, 
maybe they'll, they'll feel more comfortable with the project. And again, you're trying to give people early heads up about things that, that might be happening in the project. Um, you want to document your design uh, somewhere other than code. Uh, Non-developers rarely read code comments. Um, so put just like, you know, sometimes a paragraph's enough. Right? Just put it in, the, in an issue um, or a commit message is, is okay on uh, PR. Uh, wikis or, you know, met, uh, markdown um, files in the uh, main repo are oftentimes better. Uh, it's just more accessible to, to users than um, uh, trying to figure out, you know, connect these, this function to this function in the code and say, like, is, is this, what, what did you mean here? Uh, so the simple explanation of, like, how, maybe how a cache works or, you know, how, how errors are handled or, or network errors or something like that, that, that can actually be really valuable to your users. Okay, uh, thinking about sustainability. This last part of the talk. Um, so I've described to you <laughs> more work essentially, which as some of you might be scratching your head, like how will this help sustain my project? Um, and the trade-off you're gonna need to make is you need to write less code to do these other things. Uh, and that's it's kind of in, not, not really what I wanna be doing, but I wanna make these projects successful. And so I, I, I do them. And so uh, the kind of, the thing I have in my head is I want to do fewer things and I want to do them over longer periods of time. And so just thinking about like, if I have N work I'm going to do over two years, maybe instead I will, I'll do, you know, uh, instead of N half, N half work uh, every year, I'll do N over 10 work or something. So I can do things for five years instead of two years. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's just thinking about stretching yourself out over time. These projects have a lot of value uh, with age, the more people adopt them. And you want to make sure there's uh, a consistent pin maintainer with them. Um, but sometimes it's better if the original author should step aside and let others maintain the project. Uh, just because you created something or, or contributed to it once isn't like a lifetime guarantee. Um, and if you can find someone that's better to take over the project or collaborate with, please promote them to from contributor to maintainer. Um, that's, that's good for you and good for the ecosystem, good for everyone. And, I've um, been in projects where the original author stepped aside, and that was fine. Uh, they moved on to new projects and created new great things, and you know, no, no hard feelings there. So I think that it's um, you want to think about the long term as a maintainer. It's I, I think it's entirely reasonable to think about where do you want the project to be project to be next year. You know, that that kind of allows you to make some more. Um, uh, meaningful investments and in maybe tooling or, or uh, testing or, or something that, um, you know, I'm going to be around in a year. I, I want this project to be better for me and better for our users. You know, what, what would that take to get there? Because that's probably not just fixing a couple issues. It might be, you know, thinking about some kind of speed or, or uh, compatibility or, or data, um, uh, data integrity or something like that. And I think it's reasonable to think about the project. It, it might exist in 10 years. Uh, maybe you're not making a year by year plan, <laughs> but you know, it, is, there some, is there somewhere you're going as a project? Uh, and it, it, sometimes it's, it's useful to have a big idea, right? Like uh, jcloud's idea is to create the widest um, uh, cross cloud abstraction that it, it can. And that, that's a kind of a good goal. Uh, but you, how are you going to get there? You need to keep opening the aperture of this uh, compatibility over time with more providers and more APIs and this kind of thing. So uh, think about how you're going to get there. Um, so ask yourself a couple of questions. Um, what, what kinds of changes are truly impactful for your users? Um, because it's really easy to just be reactive uh, and you fix random issues. Like here's, here's an issue, there's an issue, boom, you know, progress. Um, and that's the reason that's not good is because there's loud users that kind of advocate for things and change, and distort like how what things you think are important, and so you really want to to like again put your product manager hat on and, and think about what is most important. And are, are there any broad themes you can progress on? You know, performance, compatibility, these kinds of things. And so your project may outlast your interest in it. And um, can you prepare for the next maintainer? And sometimes that that doesn't mean like hey you over there you you need to maintain this now, all that, that's really great when that happens. Um, but keeping the project in, in a state of good repair um, is, is a good idea. Uh, I've seen a couple projects where the maintainer quit kind of uh, bur in rage burnout and that it was tough for the project to move forward. And so you really kind of want to uh, reduce your involvement over time if you're planning to leave instead of uh, just uh, up and, and running away. 
Um, think about your, your commitment to the project. Um, like how much time do you really want to spend on this project per month on this uh, open source project? Um, and I think that there's just kind of three buckets if you put this into uh, one hour. Uh, I think you can effectively maintain some project with one hour a month, uh, you know, just reviewing uh, PRs and uh, periodic, periodically cutting releases. Uh, that's, that's fine. Um, 10 hours a month is a little more interesting. You can actually kind of invest in the project and not just be reactive. You know, maybe you work on write some code. <laughs> it's usually um, yeah, fun. Um, there are projects uh, that you can put 100 hours in, the, in a month into. Uh, I've, I've started some projects where the, the first month was pretty intense and that was great. Uh, certainly couldn't sustain that um, uh, without corporate sponsorship. If it's not your day job, where do you, where do you get that kind of time from? Um, so when, when, you, when you think about your time commitment, think about setting a budget. Like I only want to spend an hour on this project every month. You know, maybe you don't review all the PRs, you don't respond to all the issues, you know, you just you pick the, the things you think are important and then you, you stop and that's okay. Um, because otherwise you kind of tend to, to just go in random directions and oh, this looks interesting now, you know, maybe I'll, I'll spend five hours in this. And you know, maybe, maybe that's fun and maybe it's okay that it happens. But uh, when you think about maintainership, I, I really think that if I'm gonna do one hour of maintainership, then I, I need to do that one hour. Uh, also think about the quality of service you wanna provide. Uh, a, lot, a lot of developers work in interrupt driven manners and they, they kind of context switch between things and that's uh, ex expensive. Uh, a lot of the work we, we do requires concentration. Um, and so it might be better to batch process uh, things. And so, uh, you know, I'm gonna look at these issues once a month, once every three months maybe for some projects and work through them and to keep all that context in my head. Um, this could also be good batch processing uh, because uh, users can kind of figure out things on their own sometimes and maybe you didn't need to be involved and, and uh, react immediately. Uh, and a reminder that not everything needs to be done today. Um, you know, there's always tomorrow um, and maybe maybe something never need to be done. Uh, there's certain kinds of um, uh, features that kind of come in, into a fad and then go away, uh, cloud providers and all sorts of things. And, you know, they, maybe they, you don't need to do this. And you, you can always say not yet. Okay, wrapping up here, um, kind of hit the, the main points again. You wanna prioritize the issues that are important to your users. Uh, you wanna enable contributors uh, and outsource as many tasks uh, from you onto the community that you can. Um, make technology decisions that allow you uh, to evolve the project over the long term. Um, it's okay to say no or not yet. I say it early and often, it's, it's okay. You, won't hurt, you will not hurt people's feelings. And uh, think about the long term. Uh, this project will, a lot of projects are still used a year or 10 years um, after the creation. And um, they, they are valuable. Uh, the small ones, the big ones, and everywhere in between. Right. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, you can see the so uh, slides at gall.org slash talks. And I believe there's a uh, chat Q&A following this. Thanks again.